Thomas. My name is Tom Stapleford. I'm a faculty member here at Notre Dame in the program of political studies, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Benjamin Perlbeck. So ben is an associate professor at the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. He's trained in science and technology studies, STS, with a focus on the history of modern biomedical and life sciences, and his research lies at the intersection of STS, bioethics, and political theory. He studies the changing relationships between science, politics, and law, and the governance of biomedical research and innovation, examining the interplay of science and technology with democracy, religious and moral pluralism, and public reason. He received his doctorate in history of science from Harvard University in 2010, and his AB in classics with a minor in history from Stanford University. His talk this afternoon is titled Growing Up, Progress, Play, and the Biotechnologies of Maturation. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Benjamin Rowland. Thank you so much, Tom, and, and uh, thank you to the conference organizers, especially Carter Sneed, um, and to Margaret, who has made all the trains run remarkably on time, um, and also to whoever organized the snow. It's really nice to get snow done. I don't know it is. It doesn't happen much. Um, okay. Uh, so, in, the, in 1976, in the early days of the biotechnology revolution, a member of, that, of the revolutionary vanguard named Robert Sinsheimer observed that humanity had entered a moment of fundamental transition in its relationship to life. It was a transition from creature to creator, um, from being embedded in the, quote, security of that web of natural evolution that blindly and strangely bore us and of all of our fellow creatures into an uncharted territory we, where we will be increasingly on our own. A couple of months ago, the journal Cell published a paper detailing an experiment in which mouse human embryonic stem cells were cultured in such a way that they self-organized into a biological formation resembling a human mouse embryo. That entity was placed in this device, a bunch of spinning bottles basically, and grown up to just shy of halfway through mouse development. Um, at eight and a half days mouse gestation is 19 days. Here is a close-up of, uh, of one of the bottles, and you can see the yolk sac of this mouse embryo floating around in the special juice, the magic juice that keeps it going. A very similar um, experiment published uh, out of a lab at Caltech just, you know, very shortly after that, um, did a, a very in-depth analysis of their, their synthetic mouse embryos, as they're calling them, um, and revealed that basically in terms of both morphology and gene expression, they're nearly identical with, uh, you know, a naturally conceived and produced mouse. Here's a, a, a comparison. The synthetic, whatever it is, is on the top and the mouse is on the bottom. 95% um, similarity to the caption says, depending on how you measure it. Um, this is the cover of the issue of cell that this paper appeared in. It says, this is not a mouse embryo. So, of course, the, the cover is a riff on this painting um, by the surrealist painter uh, René Magritte. Um, so this is not a pipe. Well, what is it? It's a fiction. It's a mere representation. Here's Magritte. Could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a rep representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. So Magritte's act of creation, his representation of a pipe, is also a kind of negation, a paradox. It's playing a trick. It's an act of foolery that displaces one presumptive reality into another. It's a worldly thing and uh, rendered otherworldly. It's a not pipe that floats in a kind of placeless space on the background, like, I think intentionally, a botanical specimen in a taxonomic print. So this is not a mouse embryo. But in this case, the image on the cover of cell is acting like a naturalist print. Take note. It has a material biological referent, the synthetic laboratory construct that is not a mouse ever. So the cover image is an image of an image, you might say. Whereas Magritte plays his trick on the canvas, the scientists play their trick on the laboratory bench. But it looks like a mouse embryo. It feels like a mouse embryo. It has gene expression patterns like a mouse embryo. Surely it's a mouse embryo, right? Here's one of the creators of the, the, the Caltech group, the leader of the Caltech group that also created these not mouse embryos. Um, 
Uh, absolutely, they're only embryo models. They're not real embryos. For example, they don't establish a placenta. So this is true. It doesn't establish a placenta. It doesn't have the, the um, uh, line that's the cellular line that's necessary to contribute to placenta. But one of these two labs is actually figuring out how maybe you can just skip the placenta and, and attach some sort of perfusion machine um, to this not a mouse embryo um, and supply it with what it needs in order to keep it going in development beyond the limit that it seems to be currently hitting, which again is about eight and a half days out of 19 days on the way to, to mouse pup. So the project of my talk today is to explore who says this is not a mouse embryo and what's at stake in saying it. The what is it question is increasingly asked at the frontiers of biotechnological creation about organoids growing complex self-organizing structures that resemble organs in vitro, including brain, human animal chimera, and a kind of growing menagerie of bioengineered constructs. So saying what it is or is not tends to be the first step in a whole line of important things that happen, um, particularly evaluating the ethical acceptability of the experiments when you're talking about dealing with human stuff. It's what the oversight bodies focus on, what the National Academy's consensus committees are concerned with, as people who attended the organoids panel yesterday heard about. Um, uh, it's what the bioethicists foc focus on and the rules and, and guidelines uh, are about. And, and this is an absolutely important focus. Uh, it's enormous, an enormous amount turns on judgments of this is or is not. But what Magritte's painting invites us to focus on is not so much the pipe, um, but on Magritte and on ourselves, right? On the author and the apprehenders, the creator and the consumer. And consumer, of course, for Magritte is key. The consumer is not just the eye that takes in the image, but the social relation that, the, that structures that apprehension. So Magritte's day job was making posters, commercial posters, advertisements, basically. And this painting is very much in that sort of genre, right? So the purpose of an advertisement, of course, is to affect a particular kind of relation between a would-be consumer and an object, except a sort of surreal relation, a relation not with that object, but some representation of that object that also brings into being a kind of, or activates a set of social relations that move capital out of the pocket of the of the viewer and into the pocket of the producer, right? Um, so, so Magritte's image is sort of seeking to surface these social relations. The little, the little, this is not a pipe, um, is the clue to those social relations. In this case, though, something quite different is happening. Whereas Magritte's trick is to expose these relations, this little bit of script occludes them. It says what is or is not. And then the rest just sort of falls into place. The research tells the ethics body, the ethics body stamps the forms and certifies the funder that everything is as it should be and reassures the public who read the hyped up article in Wired Magazine. The technology transfer officer files the patent, the examiner discerns an invention, not, you know, this is not a mouse embryo, this is a patentable, um, uh, this is a patentable technology. Grants the pat patent, the startup forms, the venture capital flows, the product is prototyped, eventually brought to market, et cetera. So as you can see, a lot turns on this sort of is, is not judgment, which is made in multiple different domains, um, but comes back to a kind of is, is not question. But so what? It's a mouse, or it's not a mouse. It's, this, it's a thing. We do all kinds of stuff with mice. Are lab mice really mice anymore? Who knows? Um, uh, it's interesting. It's pretty wild. It's cool, isn't it? Um, it matters, and I'm gonna argue that it matters. Not so much, I mean, you, you may think that the mouse matters. I think that the mouse matters. Um, but the concern is not primarily the mouse and it's is a mouse or is not a mouse status, but the modes of distinguishing, the difference making, and the work that that difference making does, and the larger environment that that difference making sits in. So just to give you a sense of why this difference making matters, or one significant reason this different making, difference making matters, replace this is not a mouse embryo with this is not a human embryo, okay? Now you're paying attention, right? Now you're excited. Um, let me just, for those of you who are in a betting mood, let me just say that my guess is that the this is not a human embryo will appear, probably not in this kind of playful form on the cover of Cell, but somewhere in Cell or Science or Nature within about six months. Um, and actually, the this is not a human embryo has already appeared early in that chain, I would guess, early in that chain, 
It's an educated guess, okay? Um, uh, my research involves a certain amount of spying, and I can't always reveal everything I know, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, that it, it's already made its appearance early in the chain of, you know, dear ethics committee, can we conduct, conduct this experiment? Um, dear patent examiner, look at our cool invention. Uh, here is its utility. Here is its value. Here is its commercializable potential. Uh, dear venture capitalists, don't you want to invest? The venture capitalists have invested. The startup exists, et cetera, et cetera, OK? Um, take note that there was a certain amount of surprise when I said that, I think, in the audience. Um, so you guys, you guys are ahead of the game. But most people will be surprised when the article turns up in Wired and, you know, that this is not a mouse embryo, um, suddenly is out there in public space, right? Um, when you do eventually get brought into the loop, you're bound to feel like there's, you know, kind of nothing that you can do except react to these sort of crazy frontiers, things in science and technology that you have no control over but are going to shape your world in quite profound ways. Um, and then you're going to look around for somebody who knows how to read a cell paper to ask them, is this really a, not a human embryo or is it in <coughs> fact a human embryo, right? So how did you end up in this situation? That's one of the things I want to talk about today. What are the conditions of possibility, the prerequisites, the infrastructures, material, metonymic, political, that this statement, this is not a mouse or this is not a human embryo, are built upon? We tend to think that science, scientific advances raise ethical questions. First you have science, then you have the ethical questions, and if there are fundamental disagreements about them, you have political debate and division. If you're able to resolve them and agree upon something, you get law. Uh, the consequence is that law always lags behind, right? You always get it after the fact, if you get it at all. But for the moment, I want to ask you to let those ideas go and try to see what Magritte is showing you with his image. Uh, not the fictions that make the wheels of capitalism move in this case, but the orthodoxies that underwrite scientific and technological progress. And I want to argue that these orthodoxies sit within and are expressions of political, moral, even teleological commitments, but tacit ones, ones that we tend not to think about or talk about or to interrogate and are actually built into those structures of relations from the is question answered by the experts who are also the ones conducting the experiments for the ethics committees that, you know, speak to the funders, that talk to the venture capitalists, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, put slightly differently, I want to explore our capacity or incapacity to think and speak about what we are increasingly able to do. Those capacities for collective imagination and collective understanding. This is Hannah Arendt in 1958. Speech is what makes man a political being. Okay, so this is a way of being human, not as a human embryo or not human embryo, but as a member of a political and moral community. And here's, here is Arendt worrying over the kind of technological future that she sees on the horizon and the ways of knowing that that future entails and what it means for our capacities to be the kind of political beings that we are, right? Um, will we forever be unable to understand, that is to think and speak, about the things which we are nevertheless able to do? So what I want to argue, what I hope to show here, is that social, moral, and political realities are co-created with projects like this in science and technology. And if we want to understand our positions as creators who have exited or are increasingly exiting that web of relations, uh, we have to attend to those forms of co-creation. Let me give you a kind of um, set of axioms, maybe, that hopefully will guide, prime how you hear the stories that I will then tell you. So number one, technology governs social life as profoundly as law. And yet the kinds of questions that we ask about technology, we tend not to ask. The kinds of questions we ask about law, we tend not to ask of technology. We tend not to think of, of technology as a political project, as a politically situated project, whereas we think of law um, as, as political par excellence, right? Um, but think about it. Technology is materialized morality. The built world, the, the forms of organization and constraint that we impose upon ourselves that are both constraining and liberatory, which is, of course, in effect, what constitutions, what law does for us, um, are built into, materialized in the kind of, of technological formations that surround us. These are not just stuff, although stuff matters unequivocally, but also the kind of ordering devices that are all over the place in the sort of technical governance of the worlds that we inhabit. Standards, classifications, calculations of risk, and so forth. 
Note that these are is, is not distinctions for the most part, right? Is this the sort of thing that falls into this classificatory, into this classification or not, right? Does it meet the threshold of the pollutants? Does it, et cetera, okay? Back of those, of course, are imaginations and imperatives of progress. A good society must be ordered in particular ways. A good society builds around itself the cocoon of technology of a certain sort that configures lives in the right sort of way for the sake of flourishing, for the sake of freedom, for the sake of progress, for economic growth, whatever it is, right? There are ideas of progress and public good that are woven into these formations. And back of those, in turn, are ideas of of creator and creation. When do we overstep the boundaries of interventions in life? When are those, the creation of these regimes right and appropriate? Expressions of, of enlightenment, of, of the kinds of obligations and responsibilities and aspirations that define us as political communities. And if we think about all of these, if we take all of these and package them together, I think we have to see these as elements of the constitutional order that we inhabit and yet which are unwritten uh, in the sense of, you know, the, the document with its texts that, you know, uh, Carter teaches young, bright law students to read. We, we don't teach courses in technological constitutional law, and yet that's precisely what we should be doing, I think. There's an imperative to do that, not least because seeing the ways in which we are governed, the ways in which asymmetries in power are made and enacted in social life, is fundamental to the fabric of democracy, of rule of law, et cetera. And so these are the kind of things that I want to draw out through a series of stories, which I will now launch into. So this is sort of part one, act one, the great disembedding. Those of you who are Charles Taylor fans will recognize a phrase borrowed from him. The story, this is his, his um, label for, the, for a sort of process of transformation that brought us into modernity where the the um, person was sort of drawn out of a kind of web of relations which were, which were worldly and sacral um, and, and uh, inter all kinds of things, intersubjective, inter, et cetera, um, the sort of the world of Adam um, into the sort of position of the atom with a T uh, of modernity, the individual that exists in a kind of disenchanted world, okay? Note that the story of enlightenment is a story of maturation, a story of growth, of, of humanity growing up. The great disembedding is a sort of leaving of the nest, you know, out of the world of myth into the world of reason. Uh, enlightenment is humanity leaving its self-imposed immaturity. Sinsheimer is pointing us towards a, a great disembedding. Maybe it's an extension of Taylor's great disembedding. Maybe it's a riff. Maybe it's a new chapter in that or some sort of transformation. I'm not sure. But it is a great disembedding, one that is so profound and yet so under-theorized that we tend to wave our hands and say, oh my god, those people did that thing. That's so scary. Um, but don't ask the questions about what are the underlying Im imaginations of progress, of maturation that are driving the maturation of technologies whose project is to produce the maturation of not mouse embryos, or not human embryos for that matter. So the story begins here with not a mouse, but a microbe. This modest little microbe is E. coli K12, and it was the sort of constitutive technology for the development of biotechnology in the 1970s with recombinant DNA. So as recombinant DNA technologies emerged, there was a lot of worry about the possibility that now that scientists had shifted from describing life as it was given in nature by evolution to transforming life to produce forms, novel forms of life that had simply not existed before, leaping across vast evolutionary chasms and so forth, that they might produce something bad, right? They might produce something dangerous. But actually, the concerns were broader than that. They were that they might produce something that was not good, that they would look upon or we would look upon and say that it was not very good, that it was very bad. How would we know, right? Remember, remember, uh, Sinsheimer asks that question, how will we even know? So the problem, which spilled over into all kinds of domains, this is the National Academy of Sciences, which doesn't tend to see political protest very often, right? This was a quite spectacular moment. Um, that problem got, got solved. This is a long and interesting story, but I'm going to make it very short. That problem got solved 
by taking those problems of governance, the question of would it be good or bad, and how would we know, how do we ask that question, who asks that question, in what forum do we ask that question, through what processes of deliberation and judgment do we arrive at an answer, took those questions and transmuted those questions into problems of the laboratory, into the technical assessment of the means through which risk would be contained, uh, would be delimited to the laboratory, okay? There were three dimensions to this kind of containment. Number one, biohazards, so novel microbes and so on and so forth, would be locked up in the laboratory. If the a new engineered form of life couldn't escape from the laboratory, then what's the problem? It's, you know, the, the zone of governance is the laboratory itself, the space of scientific creativity and freedom, right? Um, but the, this distinction note was not just between, you know, the sort of biosphere of the laboratory and the biosphere of the world, but also between these as, as spaces of freedom, spaces of authority, the laboratory in the world, between science and society, the zone that was governed by the scientist and the zone that was governed by the people and its representatives, say. And it was also a kind of distinction in ways of reasoning, in, in reasons, in modes of knowledge, between the technical and the ethical, the safe and risky versus the good and bad. So that you ask questions of containment, not in terms of, is this experiment we're doing a good experiment, but in terms of what are the precautions that are being taken in order to keep this experiment locked up so that we don't need to ask the questions of good and bad because those are worldly questions and this experiment will never enter the world and therefore we only need to ask these delimited technical questions of risk assessment, okay? So take note that this is a kind of political demarcation as well as a technical demarcation as well as a material, ontological, technological demarcation. And the centerpiece of this regime of governance was this little guy, uh, a, an E. coli that was meant to be engineered. In the end, they didn't bother engineering it, but that's sort of neither here nor there. The engineered version of the E. coli, by the way, was the first patent on, on a, um, the first product patent on a microorganism. Um, it was a, it, it was basically a, a technology, a, a microbe transmuted into a technology uh, that would, um, that could only survive in the laboratory. And so if it got flushed down the drain by accident, it wouldn't grow in the sewer, it wouldn't you know, ride out on people's clothes or in their intestines or whatever. So the incompetencies of this little technology um, meant that the, the competencies of governance that would have been required in a kind of broader domain and the wider world of good and bad didn't have to be brought to bear. You could draw a strict separation between those. But we can focus on the little micro, but actually the containment was a strategy, it was, a, it was an approach of governance. You might say that it was a kind of regulatory regime, a kind of legislative project in which law, in which regulation would be transmuted into material technology that would place constraints upon research, namely keep it in the laboratory and thereby set research free. And what came to pass from this was the sort of notion of the laboratory as a free space in which experimentation could take place unfettered, that you could play with stuff, you could tinker. It was a kind of a sandbox, a sandbox segregated from the wider world that didn't need to be governed by the norms of the wider world because it was a world unto itself. The idea of containment has sort of expanded outward through various iterations and ideas of, of technologies of containment, to make this sandbox, this otherworldly sandbox, separated by life itself from the, the wider biotic world, um, to include the totality of the biosphere. So this is a paper from a few years ago describing a, a technology of containment in which basically the organisms that would be used as experimental organisms would be constructed with an entirely synthetic genetic code. So, you know, it's sort of like the scientist playing God, scattering the peoples at the Tower of Babel, such that they could not speak to each other. The, the artificial organisms could not speak, have intercourse with the, with the natural organisms, and thereby you would create a kind of inalienable alienation of uh, the artificial life from natural life, and that artificial life could exist in the world without existing in the world, if you see what I mean. Um, so, here is a form of artificial life that exists in the world without existing in the world. That, the, this life is a not life, 
just as this life is a not life. But let's take note of the significance of the declaration of is, is not. This is an old experiment. Um, this is, you know, I think it was 2014-ish, um, in which uh, somebody engrafted uh, human glial progenitor cells, brain cells, um, into a fetal mouse. Um, and the mouse grew up and it ran through mazes faster than your average mouse. It was a pretty awesome mouse. Well, was it a mouse or was it a not mouse? Was it a mouse human? Was it a super mouse? Was it some kind of other thing? Well, it was definitely a technology. But of course, the, the is, is not answer takes that mouse into a place uh, that the, the creator of that mouse isn't interested in going. The mouse might cross out into the wider world um, if, it is a mouse, if it is not a mouse, and therefore it's declared that it is a mouse. So you can see here this guy exercising his jurisdiction over the question of is, is not, and thereby shutting down the whole chain of associations that I described earlier, okay? As a consequence of these techniques of containment and these techniques of delimitation of risk from, of risk, safety risk from good, bad, of science from politics, of laboratory from world, et cetera, um, this is the kind of laboratory space that has grown up. Actually, I would argue that the more significant laboratory space is this. This is a human embryo. Actually, I won't tell you what kind of embryo it is, right? Because this could be a human embryo, it could be a mouse embryo, it could be a humanoid embryo or an, a human embryoid. Um, as it happens, it's a human embryo. Um, grown up to, to sort of, this is about 12 or 13 days of development, okay? So take note that these little moves that began with a microbe have taken us to this as our playground, have authorized, in effect, forms of play that are predicated on the is, is not question and what chain of social relations that kicks into action um, and thereby authorize and, and even mark as virtuous forms of irresponsibility, namely of play, that are undertaken in order to explore and engineer life um, in a way that is contained morally and biologically to an, a kind of artificial and experimental space. Okay, progress. This is a complete throwaway. Advances in science and technology raise ethical questions, right? This is the process from science to technology to society. And, you know, the fact that you guys haven't heard of the not human embryo yet uh, is because we're sort of three quarters of the way through the technology phase of this. Once it arrives at that second arrow, then you will hear of it and you will have an opportunity to react, but not to anything that's gone on upstream of that arrow, right? Your zone of governance is downstream of that arrow. This, this construct, which I would argue is not actually how innovation happens, but is how governance of innovation happens, particularly in this country. So this is not a model of science and technology and innovation. This is a model, this is a model of, of governance, of democratic governance, a political model, okay? This model's origin was here, Trinity, the first detonation of the atom bomb. The guy who was back of this project was the author of this text, which, which um, you might say, you know, hearkening back to Robert Harrison's talk um, the other day, is one of the most influential philosophical texts in, sp in spurious infinity um, that, that, has, that was uh, developed at least in the 20th century. Okay? This text laid out the sort of vision for federal support of public support of science and technology that was built on a kind of model of basic research, the vocabulary of basic and applied research traces back to the endless frontier, um, where basic research would be the engine of technological innovation which would produce benefits for society, from science to technology to society. And after all, that was what happened with the Manhattan Project, basically, right? This, of course, is not just a sort of model of how innovation happens, that's what it was presented as but rather it's a model of social relations between institutions. You might say that it's a model of sovereignty. And the political theorist of this idea of sovereignty, I think, is Michael Polanyi, who wrote an essay called The Republic of Science, in which he says, the soil of academic science must be extraterritorial in order to secure its rule by scientific opinion. It must be democratic, but it must be insulated from democracy to be true democracy, to be governed by science as opposed to governed by the, the wayward whims of politics. Right? This is 
an instantiation of territorialization or of extraterritoriality, right? This is a technological instantiation of the demarcation between the distinct territories, yeah? And what I want to point to is the way that this is not just a project of scientific and technological innovation. Other kinds of institutions cooperate in this. One of the, the sort of key moments of cooperation in the history of biotechnology is this. The US Supreme Court decision in Diamond v. Chakrabarty, which said that an engineered microorganism is not a bacterium, it's a technology, right? Uh, his discovery is not nature's handiwork, but his own. Is. Is, is not. That was the question, right? Is it nature or is it artifice? Is this a pipe or is this a representation of something else? Is it an artistic creation? This case also, at the same time, offers a kind of ersatz theory of the relationship between science and law that says no matter what this court does, science will progress. No matter what we do, it will not deter the scientific mind from probing into the unknown any more than Canute could command the tides. So the, the move that was made in this moment, which was basically to create a kind of chain of associations of metaphorical or metonymic associations between a synthetic chemical and a synthetic organism and treat the synthetic organism as effectively like a synthetic chemical um, and thereby make the synthetic organism a, an object of ownership to say that it's a technology that has a utility, that kind of chain of associations has a logic to it, right? And you can't stop that logic once you set it going because it doesn't actually care much about microbes, it's perfectly happy to apply that same logic to mice, and actually at the end of the day to men and women, humans. Um, so this is, uh, there's much more to say about that, but I'm gonna sort of skip over everything in the middle and point to a kind of, a kind of political intervention into a kind of technocratic regime that was undertaken by um, a developmental biologist in the late 90s, where he filed a patent for human animal chimera. Basically a simple thing. You take a chimp, you take a human embryo, you stick them together. What do you get? You get a human Z. I, I, was a, I had a Thanksgiving dinner with my then girlfriend, now wife, and her crazy uncle was going on about the human Z, and all the family were like, oh my god, this guy's crazy. I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right on, man. This is real. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so this was a sort of breaching experiment into this stronghold of technocracy that is engaged in is-is-not distinctions every day at scale, um, structuring uh, technoscience and its industrial and social consequences by granting or not granting patents. Um, and the, the US Patent and Trademark Office, A, didn't know what to do with this, and B, was seriously pissed that somebody had politicized what was supposed to be a, a purely technical domain that was part of that chain of associations that exists on the technical, you know, political, the, the is, is not versus the good, bad sort of side of the distinction, okay? Eventually, this, this uh, project sort of um, petered out. They felt they had made their point. Uh, one of the things to say is that at the moment, the re response from the scientific community was, this is ridiculous, this is transgressive because nobody would ever do this. Um, this is an uh, experiment that was done just a handful of years ago. Things have matured beyond this phase of experimentation. Um, this, this experimenter produced human monkey, human primate chimera that he grew in vitro to 19 days of embryogenesis, at which point I, I, I uh, asked him this at a meeting and he, a couple of years ago, and he, he uh, said that the experiment was halted for ethical reasons. So, okay, maybe that's good, but take note that this person has, in effect, laid claim to jurisdiction over the question of what the limits should be. That is, over the question of when the is-is-not boundary is crossed, it becomes something that might be transgressive and is regulating himself. It, it is in keeping with the regime of self-regulation that was invented in the 1970s, okay? So these are the moves to look for. Jurisdiction. He is, in effect, speaking the law by declaring what the limit should be by enacting that limit and thereby setting a sort of standard and norm that of course is about as strong, is about as permanent as he wishes it to be because he is the legislative author, right? Back of this is a kind of naturalized sovereignty. Science is sovereign. The sandbox of science is sovereign. Um, and 
for the political theorists out there, I think the right way to think about this is in decisionist terms, in Schmidtian terms. It's deciding on the exception, but it's also creating the exception. It's creating the potentially transgressive case that has not been contended with before and declaring what it is and governing on that basis. And this is constitutionalism. This is the writing of fundamental but small c tacit constitutional orders or provisions, you might say, that has back of it, I now want to argue, a theory of law and lawfulness. This is the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Marsha McNutt, a comment that she made on the release of an important report on human, uh, human genome editing, on creating, in effect, genetically engineered children. As is always the case, the speed at which the science is advancing outpaces society's ability to grasp its implications. This is a throwaway line, right? Technology is moving so fast, society can't keep up, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you guys maybe are familiar with this guy, the Chinese scientist who produced genetically engineered babies in 2018 and, and caused a sort of international uproar. In an interview I did with him in December 2018, he explained his motivation this way. If we're waiting for society to reach a consensus, it's never going to happen. But once one or a couple of scientists make the first kid, it's safe, healthy, then the entire society, including science, ethics, and law, will be accelerated. It will speed up. So this is a theory of, of science and law, you might say. This is a theory of, of legal order that is also a theory of progress that is also, and, and, the, and he's not, he didn't make this up. I mean, he took it from Marsha McNutt and a thousand other people, right? Uh, that is also a theory of his self-authorization, his sovereignty, his scientific sovereignty. So I decided in my sandbox to break the glass. What do we do about this? So the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, which is the regulatory authority in the UK that oversees the kind of things that I've been talking about, is worried about all of these developments. Why? Because it thinks that its rules, which set limits on what can and can't be done, are basically getting to be obsolete. Science is racing ahead, and their law is lagging behind. So we need to revise the legislation in order to, this is the president, this is the um, chair of the HFEA, um, just, th this is maybe two months ago. Um, future, we need to future-proof the law in order to accommodate future scientific developments. Well, what does that mean? So genome editing, heritable genome editing, is one of the sort of reasons for future-proofing. Um, the other one is this, the capacity to grow human embryos beyond the 14-day limit, which is a sort of widely adhered to rule, but which was um, first sort of really codified in black letter law in, in uh, the UK. And here are just a couple of state, sorry, Carter, take your picture. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true, actually. They, the, Soviets, the Soviets sent a couple of scientists. They had little cameras. They took their pictures, yeah. Um, so so uh, um, here are a couple of, here's a grab bag of statements about why, why revision to this limit, which was a fundamental moral limit, is necessary in light of technological development. Well, I mean, these advances raise the question again of where to place the ethical limits on human embryo research in vitro. Well, well do they? I mean, if you can suddenly become capable of breaking a law, does that mean you've got to change the law? It's kind of a strange idea. But this is a very common way of thinking about science and technology. These advances put human developmental biology on a collision course with a 14-day rule. The rule is no longer fit for purpose. There's building pressure to extend or even abolish this limit, et cetera. So what is HEFEA doing? They are inventing a regulatory sandbox an ethical sandbox uh, to accommodate the scientific sandbox. Uh, and there, this is drawn from financial regulation, this model, where you want to keep things flexible because you want the money to flow. You don't want to, you know, create barriers to investment. Um, you know, London wouldn't be the same place if, if uh, transnational money wasn't flowing through it. So it's a flexible approach to encourage innovation through controlled experiments in which the technologists and the regulators kind of collaborate and try things out. Let's make a few babies, let's, et cetera, and see how it goes, and we will innovate uh, accordingly. So informed development of future regulatory approaches, and this is the key thing, so that policy can manifest and develop through stages, so that it can mature. So this is a biotechnology of maturation. So, the babies in China produced an international outcry. He shouldn't have done it. It was transgressive. He went rogue, et cetera, et cetera. What was the reason? 
because this was the word that was used, because it was premature. The technology had not yet matured. So the judgment about ethical transgression was actually a judgment about technological maturity, okay? So leaving self-imposed immaturity is, in other words, technological innovation. It is producing technological innovation and it's producing those modes of adjustment, realignment, and reasoning, those forms of politics that the maturation of technologies also require. So socio-political and moral maturation, legal maturation follow from biotechnologies of maturation. So these three words were formative for the um, babies in China. Uh, Ho was at a meeting a few years before he undertook this project where he encountered James, Wa James Watson, a sort of towering figure in, in the history of biology of Watson and Crick, the discoverer of the structure of DNA. And he asked him these sort of questions including, you know, what do you think about using genome editing to engineer children, not just to treat disease, but actually to, you know, to uh, prevent disease, to enhance, in effect, uh, the future children. And Watson couldn't hear. He has a heavy accent. Watson is old and deaf. He asks He to write it down. He writes it down. Watson writes his answer. These three words, make people better. So this, that piece of paper ended up on the wall of the laboratory in which these experiments were conducted. By the way, it's the name of a documentary that's going to come out about this case in about a month that was um, produced by Samir Akiani, who's sitting in the front. I encourage you all to see it when it does. Um, so, so that is make people better is a pretty good gloss on what Kant is saying in what is enlightenment, right? On the enlightenment project, on the project of maturation. Make people better. Break them out of their self-imposed immaturity. Grow them. Help them to grow up. What is the vision of the human that sits, and the human both as creator and as created, that sits at the core of this project? This is a book by the editor of, of the CRISPR journal, a guy named Kevin Davies. The term holy grail is overused in science, but if fixing a single letter in the genetic code of a fellow human being isn't the coveted chalice of salvation, I don't know what is. These are the people who say, don't talk the talk of playing God, right? And yet this is the talk of playing God. It's not that they're transgressing some sort of boundary between secular and religious, between warranted and unwarranted speech. It's that the imagination of transcendence sits imminently inside of the space of sovereign science in which it is set free to declare what in effect is or isn't good in terms of what is safe or risky, what is mature or premature, etc. Here's Sinsheimer again. This is Sinsheimer seven years earlier. Imagining the possibilities of the genetic technologies that are now on the horizon. A new eugenics would permit in principle the conversion of all the unfit to the highest genetic level for we should have the means to create new genes and new qualities yet undreamed to carry on and consciously perfect the human species. I was at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine last year and in the introductory remarks uh, of the meeting whose focus was reproduction reimagined the president of that society, which gathers together the thousands of people engaged in the fertility industry, declared that the next 40 years of IVF would see, <coughs> all, see a future in which all reproduction takes place outside the human body. So you can say, so this was the production of gametes, the engineering of those gametes, the fertilization of, of those gametes, the gestation of those gametes, the birth. The whole, the whole package takes place in a, in a sort of technological apparatus. Um, you can say, well, this is about designer babies on steroids. I, actually, I don't think so. I don't think so. The maturation that's at stake here is not about or not purely about the children that are produced, but it's about the emancipation of the liberal subject from the constraints of the body, the maturation of the human out of its self-imposed embodied immaturity into the forms of agency, choice and self-determination that are appropriate to the liberal subject. Okay, to conclude, my conclusion 
steals shamelessly from our fearless leader here, Carter Sneed, who uttered this phrase yesterday in his panel, the freedom to care for one another rightly. I want to ask, and not answer, because I don't have an answer, but I want to ask what this means. What does this look like? The freedom to care for one another rightly, because caring for one another rightly may be a moral project, but the freedom is a political project, a legal political project, but therefore also a technological project, right? And an ontological one. And so the question is, how do we understand, that is, think and speak, about the things which nevertheless we are able to do, when the things that we are able to do, in effect, speak for us? The mouse, the not mouse, declares what it is, and everything else follows from it. I took this picture in Harvard Law School. I'm not a great photographer. It's a bad picture, I'll admit it. I took this picture in Harvard Law School. The, these venerable words from Thomas Aquinas, I think, are, are quite beautiful and profound. Human law has the nature of law insofar as it partakes of, of right reason. I took this during the coffee break at an, a special closed door ad hoc committee that was convened at Harvard to ask questions about how to govern forms of, of how to govern biotechnologies of maturation that were then in the making. The focus was neural organoids in particular, but the, the much wider range of technological possibilities um, that were emerging, particularly around the capacity to vascularize uh, in vitro structures. Because you, know, you can only grow a little tiny brain if it needs to just sort of diffuse its wastes and so forth into a, into a um, in vitro environment. But if you can vascularize it, you can pump it in and out uh, and, you know, in principle, sky's the limit for its size. Um, and and the, the, the form of right reason that was on display in that room in the deliberations was the form of right reason that I've been describing, a kind of secular and sovereign right reason that begins with the is, is not question, and it moves on. What was interesting is it was a deeply frustrating discourse to the scientists who were in that room. One, I remember very clearly one of the scientists saying, my greatest fear is that I will find myself, uh, I, will, I will learn that I have been keeping an entity, you know, floating in a vat that has been frustrated that entire time. That is my greatest fear. How would one know? Well, the answer that came from the committee, which is what comes from all these committees, including the one Carter and others talked about yesterday, is, well, just don't grow anything conscious. That's not very helpful, right, if you can't ask it. Um, but what, what I want to point out here is not the answer, but the ways of asking the question, the constructions of right reason, which are the infrastructures, which are the kind of tacit political, even constitutional settlements that stand back of the formations within which these questions get asked and answered and, and elevate the is, is not question to the, the apex, right? And all forms of governance, all forms of moral sense making, all forms of deliberation follow from it. And so, you know, in the context where the question of right reason is not resolved, but oddly is also not a question, what are the forms of thinking and speaking, the modes of understanding, the forms of politics that are appropriate to the kinds of creativity, the forms of creation and the production of creators, which are not just the scientists in the lab, but the entire regime of law, politics, public, et cetera, um, that are in effect called into being around them. What are the ways of approaching right reason in those contexts? And the best answer I have to give just comes from T.S. Eliot. What have we to do but stand with empty hands and palms turned upward in an age which advances progressively backwards? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hurlbut. To kick our discussion off, I'm going to invite up uh, Dr. Nicholas Tay. Professor Tay is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. His primary research area is in the philosophy of physics, especially questions concerning the philosophical and mathematical foundations of gauge symmetry, space-time theories, and quantum field theory. Previously, he's held postdoctoral research fellowships at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge and the Quantum Group at Oxford University Comlad. Before that, he read for a PhD in History and Philosophy of Science at Trinity College, Cambridge, and he's going to offer some comments to get our discussion going. Professor Tay. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, I should begin by um, saying it's a great honor and, and pleasure to offer these remarks on your paper, Ben. Um, 
and also that these really are uh, off-the-cuff comments because I heard the paper at the same time all the rest of you did. <laughs> for which I apologize profusely. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Professor Holbert, for this deeply fascinating uh, paper, of which I think I, I agree with so much descriptively. Uh, and I would like to reflect on two issues that arise in this paper. The first is on the issue of representation. As Professor Holbert said that the, the synthetic mouse embryos can usefully be thought of as representations of a certain kind, akin to Magritte's painting. This is not a pipe. The second issue I'd like to comment on is uh, the role that right reason or reasoning plays in, in uncovering what our capacity for imagine, ima uh, political imagination, imag uh, progressive imagination might be. Okay, so let's begin with the first issue, the issue of representation. So Professor Hobart suggests to us that the synthetic mouse embryo and the Greek painting are both representations. Um, and that there is an analogy in that uh, they both raise for us the is, is not question about the content of the representation. And in the Magritte case, we see through the representation to what we see in the representation. And then we're led back to the surface feature, the, the feature of the medium, that it's a marked surface. And thus led to the the question about the ambiguity is, is this or is this not a pipe in what sense? But nonetheless, Professor Hobart thinks that there is a disanalogy in play here. This, in the case of the Magritte painting, uh, most of us would not then turn to the authority, let's say the, the art historian or the expert in, in uh, the art critic, let's say, say, hey, so do you think this is or this isn't a pipe? You'd see, well, there is a, there's an interesting analogy, uh, there's an interesting ambiguity here, and it's, it's something that we take up in judgment concerning the painting, uh, something that awakes in us uh, a, a, a further sense of what the painting is trying to disclose to us about the world. Whereas, and on the other hand, in, in the, the case of synthetic mouse embryo, the thought, I think it's a descriptive thought and probably a very accurate thought, maybe not for, for necessarily for the audience uh, in this room, but for the vast majority of people who confront such things, the, the thought is supposed to be, I, I look at that cover of Cell and I go to my biologist friend and say, could you tell me if this is or isn't a synthetic mouse embryo? And um, one of the questions I'd like to pose to Professor Hobart is, why, do you th why does this disanalogy exist? Why is there this disanalogy? Um, let me reflect a little more, I mean, pull out some more of what's at stake here in uh, trying to reflect on the nature of representation. So what is a representation? A representation always involves a medium. In the case of the Magritte painting, the marked canvas, that's the medium. In the case of that synthetic mouse embryo, the uh, embryonic stem cells and whatever other materials are used to synthesize that so-called mouse embryo. Second, the, a representation involves a subject of representation. So in the case of the Magritte painting, an actual pipe. In the case of the synthetic mouse embryo, an actual mouse embryo, right, when it was not synthetic. And third, it seems sensible to say that a representation always involves the taking up of the medium by the viewer in order to pursue the subject in the representation. So it's, it's a very specific kind of pursuit of the subject. You pursue the subject in the world of the representation. And a further curious feature is that you actually activate the surface features of a painting in order to pursue the subject. When you pursue the subject of painting in that world of painting, the surface features of painting in general, and typically, aren't transparent to the subject. Unless you, we're talking about Trump lawyer, that's a, put, that's a marginal case. Right? But in general, it's, it's really your awareness of the surface features that furthers your sense of the subject. Right? And one salient question here is, I, I think, why don't we say the same kind of thing about the synthetic mouse embryo case? What is it about 
the, um, the political consciousness that gets expressed in the culture of reception of such representations that, that leads us to be dead or not alive to the mode of reception here. And it's one of the things that Professor Horvath was pointing to. Um, furthermore, in the case of the, that Magritte painting, see, a technical expert could, of course, comment to us on all kinds of features about uh, the painting technique, right? Whether it's pointillist or impasto, whatever. I mean, you know, the, the kind of paint being used, whether it's acrylic or oil, this, that, and the other. And, and we would take that as authoritative. But there's also, I think, an, very sensibly an element, uh, well, of our judgments of art, our encounter with art, representations in general, uh, of which Oscar Wilde made the comment, um, only the very shallow do not judge by appearances. See, the, the point here is that you actually need to experience what's in, what you, ex what you see in the world of the painting in order to come to a judgment about it, and that has to be a first-hand judgment. It can't actually be a testimonial judgment. So what is so different here such that we turn to the scientist and say, give us a testimonial judgment? There's really two questions. Well, it's just a question of what's different in principle, and it's also a question of what's different in the culture of reception, in the culture of creation of such representations and receiving them. All right. I'd like to now transition to the second issue, which is the issue of, of reasoning. And I see, this is a comment, um, I myself see a, a deep analogy between a current in philosophy concerning what reasoning is and what we can hope to accomplish with it on the one hand, and the kind of diversion from asking questions about right reason that Professor Hobart was so ably, ably describing. Um, as many of you might know, uh, in a current of philosophical thought called British empiricism, uh, various exponents of this current, famously Hume, thought that reasoning is only instrumental reasoning. It's reasoning about doing X in order to do Y, in order to get Y or achieve Y, in order to achieve Z. But we can't actually reason about is that final end, Z, good or bad. That kind of question about reasoning of what to do, it doesn't make sense. But reasoning about how to get to whatever you happen to desire, no, that makes sense in this tradition. I think that forms the backdrop um, for a lot of the, uh, the compartmentalization of reasoning that Professor Horvath was describing, that's invoked by scientists in this sort of discourse that you just heard. But I also think there's something uh, much more interesting going on here that, that builds on the thought that we can only instru uh, reason instrumentally. So consider the reasoning that um, doing X was premature, where here X is uh, creating the synthetic embryo. Right? How is that related to instrumental reasoning? As I understand it, that's a kind of deferment about judgments concerning ends. There is a, skep a skepticism, it's a skepticism about the capacity to reason about ends here. But it's interestingly different from Hume because these people aren't going to come out and say, I'm actually skeptical about whether we can reason about ends. Right? You don't see that. Instead, you get this diversion. Let's defer this judgment till the technology becomes more mature. Right. And then you might ask, well, what about that technology becoming more mature is going to lead you to reason better about ends? And it, it looks like an answer isn't really forthcoming <laughs> from this sort of position, which is why I say that it's, it's something additional over skepticism concerning the ability to reason about ends. It's, a kind of evasion about reasoning concerning ends. Thank you very much.
15 minutes for questions. I'd like to invite Dr. Hurlbut back up to the podium here, and we could take some questions from the audience. I don't get to respond to Nick's excellent comments. No, 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 great. Let's take, let's take questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so my name is Kate zenker Brophy. I'll try to make myself heard across the room. Um, and you'll hear in my question my background as a pediatric physical therapist. Um, but I, at one point you mentioned, um, you used the word irresponsible and then substitute in the word play. And in my experience, play is actually an incredibly serious part of human life development and flourishing. It's joyful, educational, creative, and inspiring. Um, and I, I hear in your presentation that it can also be dangerous. So what do you view as the appropriate role of play in science? Yeah, so that's, so that's a great question. Um, let me first say that I think that the invocation of play is one of these techniques of deference that, that Nick was just referring to. Um, and that when I said, irresponsibility, um, what I meant was, you know, in the sandbox you can build whatever you want. Of course, it's true, I, I almost said something about that, but you're not supposed to eat the sand or throw it at your friends. And so there are, I mean, there are norms in the sandbox, just as there are, of course, in the Republic of Science. But there's a sense in which this, the sandbox is an unencumbered space in which creativity is what is supposed to manifest, and that's good. And I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Well, if, if there was more space in this, I would have talked about how the development of this field, so-called synthetic biology, which basically demarcates itself from the biology that came before by saying we're not, we don't do biology to understand life. We do biology in order to make stuff out of life. So I once had a conversation with a premier synthetic biologist who was going on about what a tragedy um, you know, the, the rate of extinction is the large scale species lost because, because this was like losing code from a code library. Um, if we could just sequence the damn animals before, the, you know, the, these organisms before they disappear, we would save everything that's important from them basically. Um, and, and why? Because then you can play around. It's like adding sand to your sandbox. Um, th this idea of play was sort of deployed in the early days of synthetic biology as a sort of warrant for the, the existence of that field. What we do is we mess around. And I don't know if people know about the International Genetic Engineered Machines Competition, or rather Jamboree, which takes place every year, and m students, I'm sure, from this university go. Is that true? Um, I, maybe you guys don't have an iGen team. You should. But it's, but it's play. It's like having fun with life. Um, and the kind of whimsical, irresponsible <laughs> ethos is sort of part and parcel of that. I think it's about 20 years old, and this year for the first time they had a section, a session on responsibility. Maybe it's because we had a pandemic and people think it might have come from a lab or something like that. Um, anyway, I, I think that thinking about play and thinking about play as a zone of responsibility and as a zone of maturation and in a sense as a zone of enlightenment if you think about that in sort of pedagogical terms as opposed to civilizational terms, is pretty important. But that you can't think those things well without unthinking or concurrently thinking about the kinds of delineation that, I've, that I talked about between kind of anything goes unless you can know with a kind of technical certainty that it's risky, as opposed to asking the questions, is it good? Yeah. Next yeah. Um, Nick, boy, you said a lot that was, that was um, really great. So first of all, deferral, the dynamic of deferral is exactly the dynamic. It's, I, I think that one should pay attention in these domains, not to how conversations happen, but how conversations stop. What are the conversation stoppers? It's, it, this conversation would be premature. You're talking science fiction. We don't need to talk about that. This, you know, or, or you, you know, fine, come talk with us about, you know, the ethical and value-laden value issues, but leave, you know, check your religion at the door, please. No comprehensive doctrines allowed. Or, I mean, these are, these are conversation-stopping moves. Or, you know, as, as one of my favorite moments of conversation stoppers was in the sort of politics around a ballot initiative related to um, stem cell research in the 2000s where a, a like, far-left Marxist critical feminist sociologist 
um, was declared to be a Catholic because she had views that sounded like they were sympathetic to the Catholic and was shut out of the conversation because she was Catholic. <laughs> so that's a conversation stopping move, you know what I mean? Um, but it's a, but it's, it, it also has this sort of deferral dimension to it, whether it's sort of temporal or, or sort of socio-political spatial. Um, and I think seeing that is, is uh, absolutely crucial. If we just see that and we ask, I mean, for a lot of the things I think about, I think that the simple-minded solutions that I can come up with are actually pretty simple-minded. Like if we think about that move as a power move and we ask, is that move legitimate? Not, is that based on credible knowledge, whatever, but is that move legitimate? Um, then we have a totally different kind of conversation. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about my friend Rich Dorflinger, who's sitting here, and how Rich, who is an extremely adept political actor and accomplished many things um, in our federal government during his tenure at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, would affect the most, my, my sense is, that the most effective interventions that he made was not to come and, and you know, say, look, I speak for the Catholics, of which there's you know, one in seven on the face of the earth or, whatever, or something like that, but to not the representational move, but a different kind of representational move. That is, to collect a bunch of stuff from developmental biology textbooks and put it in front of people and say, look, these guys are saying things that contradict the textbooks. Um, you know, it questions their credibility. And so that was really politically effective. But I think if you step back and you ask, why did Rich have to do that? You can see the way in which the kind of conversation demarcating lines, which are also dynamics of deferral, um, impose themselves upon people and create constraints a kind of, on the kinds of things that can be said or not said. Um, and thus, one has to play by certain rules of a certain game. And if you're quick and clever like Rich, you will get things done in the context of that game. And yet, in a funny way, unfortunately, the game intensifies itself as a consequence. I think if, when, if we see that, the, the, the house of cards comes crumbling down pretty quickly, um, gets built back up pretty fast. You have to knock it over again. But th those are, it seems to me those are the right kinds of questions to ask about right reason. Why is your reason the right reason? I mean, it's sort of as simple as that. So we're short on time, and I, there were a couple of hands up. I wanted to maybe just get a couple of questions yeah, yeah, out of the great. table, and then if you could do your best to answer them. <laughs> what we have left. So back. Thank you. This is more a poetry question than a biology one, but I was struck by your Elliot invocation at the end. And it's particularly startling that he doesn't say, in the age of the advances progressively backwards, you face against the backwards advance, or you face towards. Yep true direction of events, right? He says, you turn your palms upwards, and presumably your eyes as well. How does that, I guess, how is that the posture that you recommend, as opposed to mere kind of recalcitrance or reaction against scientific progress, quote unquote? Um, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, good yeah, positive, yeah, one more question out there, yeah. and then you can yeah. <laughs> go in. Yes. So, thank you for your uh, super description. Of what science is trying to do in order to occupy the, like, the whole playground. This is perfect. My question is that uh, are there any other people in this playground? And I mean, uh, the role of uh, the political process, the law, the constitutions, the judges, you can see. Otherwise, uh, I got the impression <laughs> that we are all men. Instead, we need a way to deal with this attack, uh, kind of a psychological question. Yeah. I, I think both of those are great questions, and I think my answer to both is, is closely related. Let me take yours first. Um, absolutely, the sandbox is populated with all kinds of people, um, as my HFEA regulators were a kind of example of. Um, and yet, who who uh, is in charge of what kind of sandcastle is going to be built, um, is there are asymmetries that, that have to be attended to there. Diagnosing it in terms of old-fashioned technocracy, so this comes back to something Nick said, to take a kind of old-fashioned Habermasian line and say, well, you know, instrumental reason has to be rendered, you know, subsidiary to the, to, to, you know, the, 
the political reason of the life world or whatever, um, uh, that presumes that it's that you can put a fence around the sandbox and you can say, well, you know, you guys get to play here, but not over in this. A actually, no. You know, if one looks, the sort of tacit kind of political theory or theories that I was trying to surface um, are suffused into all kinds of institutions of governance, including those of us who say technology is moving so fast we just can't keep up. My God, look at these new things that are coming down the line, et cetera, et cetera. Or for that matter, is it a mouse or is it not a mouse, right? Um, I, I think seeing that is, and seeing the way in which that's a political posture, maybe an unwitting one, but nevertheless a political posture is, is crucial. Um, and, you know, the Schmidtian sort of construction of sovereignty that I used, you know, deciding on the exception, creating and deciding on the exception, requires a polity that is deferential to that decision. I mean, the legitimacy of that decision is a function of a polity that defers to it. And so it's not just the deciders, but the decided for who are crucial in this configuration. I think we have to think about it at that level. You don't get into the interior spaces of science and technology and solve this problem. You, you come at it from that Arendtian dimension that says we have to think about how we understand. That is how we think and speak. We have to think about what kind of political beings we are and what imaginations of maturity and immaturity are governing our politics, which is why I think, to answer the Eliot question, in my view, the right ethical posture is a, is one of a kind of supplication. I mean, it is the hands, it is the empty hands and palms turned upward. It is a posture of, of humility combined with a kind of uncertainty about which way one should go, a sort of ambivalence. I really like the idea of ambivalence. I like the idea of ambivalence as a as a both epistemic and civic virtue. Um, uh, in a sense, all of these dynamics demand that you, you, place, you, you take a stand, you face in a direction. You locate yourself on one side or the other of a line. Not that you stop, hold still, look up, seek, you know, express humility, seek guidance, uh, and at the end of the day, you know, struggle to make, make your way to something that looks like right reason, you know, the good as it is given to us to, to see and do the good, whatever the, whatever the line is from Lincoln's second inaugural address. Um, I mean, it's, it seems to me that that, that is the challenge, and, and, and yet we have a kind of politics of antagonism and litigation around these things rather than a politics of, of genuine moral sense making, and, and to me that's the challenge. Well, that seems like a, a perfect place for us to end here. Let's thank Professor Verbal.